we offer customized, flexible nutritional counseling designed specifically for you. We work with diverse clientele, all different ages, different needs, and goals. Whether you are looking for fat loss, muscle gain, body composition shifts, improved health, performance, and endurance, we're here to help. Jason Owens on serious and silliness bodybuilding, bodybuilding legend, Olympian, and now my bestie. <laughs> What's up, dude? <laughs> whatever, whatever. What's up, brother? How are you? Chilling, chilling. I had you on my uh, old podcast, and, I have my, and I'm just going to say the, the same thing. Like, there was, a, there was a group of guys that I wanted on when I started, and it was bodybuilding. And it, one was uh, you, Dave Palumbo, Vinny Galante and Fackery, and i got all four so mission accomplished right Make that's it, it. Like, tic tac toe well, you get, you that's it you you fucking throw the... <laughs> yeah, yeah no it's true those are, those are four who, guys who cares want who cares about the rest yeah yeah, yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh you what year did you turn pro 98 and it was the nationals and you won the overall right yeah. but you had an athletic background. We were for anybody who doesn't know, we hung out together Saturday night. We had dinner. We had dinner with the wives. Bread. We broke bread and uh, yeah. I had a sip of wine. I had a <laughs> sip. And I had a half a bottle of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about you making it home. I was like, shit, dude. Yeah. <laughs> your wife drove. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I drove actually. Yeah. But uh and then um, so but we were talking, you you had a very athletic background, which I didn't know. So why don't you go into that? Because you were a football player and you played all different types of things. Well, I made my athletic background was as far as high school, but I started at a, at a young age. Um, I was a gymnast, you know, from up until basically third grade. Then uh, from third grade on, I got into football, but I started wrestling in third grade also. So it was always wrestling and football. I uh, wrestled for about seven years, played football for um, probably 11, 11 years. And I, uh, you know, I, I uh, was one of those kids where I, I did well, no matter where you put me or what I did. I had some good athletic ability and some, you know, pretty, uh, pretty good speed um, and uh, athleticism. And, uh, you know, I loved, I loved competing, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I kind of veered off into bodybuilding due to, uh, you know, uh, circumstances, home circumstances. And, and uh, I, it, it was tough to plan. Um to go to college and, and have a future in that. And even to be honest, it was even hard to plan with sports, you know, what I wanted to do because, you know, life every day was, was rough. You know, you don't know how things are going to end up each day. So you know, I didn't have the type of parents that my wife and I are, are, are giving to our daughters where, they have extreme athleticism. Also, my wife had a full ride as a Division One soccer player. So, um, you know, we always said, you know, if we had parents um, that steered us in the right direction and gave us opportunities that other kids had, who knows, you know, who knows where we could have been. Um, my rat turned off to bodybuilding because it was more of an isolated sport, an independent sport, something I could do on my own. I didn't need much financing or, or, uh, or, or, uh, you know, dependent, I, I didn't need a dependent to get me there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that was the avenue I took, you know? Um, but sports has always been my life and, and uh, I'm still a sport fanatic and, and uh, you know, I compete for my daughters now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When did you, when did you fall in love with, with bodybuilding? Was it through weight training? Was it through football rather, from weight training from football? So I kind of always had an admiration for how those guys looked, you know, there, there was a certain, like, that's how a warrior looks, you know, you get out yeah. on a wrestling mat or you go out on a football field and you have somebody who looks the part and they have athleticism, you know, that's a, that's a dangerous combination, you know, right. take a guy like a George St. Pierre, who was probably one of the best, you know, UFC fighters uh, ever. And the guy's just a great athlete. You know, he, he prepares differently for every fight. 
you know, he's doing gymnastics in one, he's doing volleyball in another, he's do, doing wrestling in one, he's doing karate in another. You know, he has all these different, uh, you know, avenues of how he enhances his athleticism. Um, but when you see somebody that has that look, I, I just thought, you know, hey, dude, that's something I want to look like an athlete that fits the description, you know? Right, yeah. So through wrestling, I always trained with weights and through football, I was trained with weights and you'd learn through the magazines on what to do and what not to do. And, and uh, you know, um, gymnastics too, you know, I started at a young age, so I kind of developed a little bit of a foundation through that, you know, mm -hmm. body weight type of exercises and movements that, you know, built some muscle structure. Um, but yeah, you admire that look. I mean, who, you know, who doesn't? Yeah, right. When did you realize I'm good at this. I can make a living at bodybuilding. So when I was 16, um, you know, I, I was one of my one of my coaches. I believe it was my gymnastics coach at a young age. He's like, let me see, stand up for a second. See, so put your hands together, and then you know, like almost like uh, you know, emulating like a most a most muscular pose, you know. And uh, and he puts me into in, in, into a look there. He's like, he's like, dude, he's like, you would be a great bodybuilder one day. You have perfect structure for a bodybuilder. So I don't know if that always stuck in my head, but even at 16, training for football and wrestling, I decided to compete in a small AAU show. And I did well. I won the Colonial America at 16 years old, beating other teenagers, not knowing anything of what I was doing and so forth. And but um after you know, senior year of high school, when I realized that uh, you know, I I got to get through high school and uh, chances are I'm just going to go to a community college um, because I didn't know what direction my life was going in. Right. 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 You know, I had no support and uh, you know, no push to really do anything. And, and it was more or less where survival every day, you know, it took a top priority. And, and I mean that in a sense of not fending for food and shelter, you know, more of fending for, uh, security and, and uh and personal welfare due to uh the home life you know gotcha uh, gotcha so so after high school i'm like you know what i'm gonna go to a community college for two years you know i'm gonna train i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that i'm gonna get a job and i'm gonna support myself i got it on my own and uh you know i competed at 19 years old and just got right into bodybuilding and it was just my drive for wanting to compete in something i always felt the need to compete in something but at 19 I won the teenage New Jersey and the muscle mania. And I was like, yeah, you know, maybe I could do something with this. You know, mm -hmm. did you have so, anybody in significant, anybody significant in bodybuilding that came to you and said, yo kid, stick with this. This is a future for you here. So I, I, I uh, at 16 years old, I joined diamond gym, which is, you know, at the time was the most, uh, you know, renowned bodybuilding gym on the East coast. If you wanted to be a bodybuilder, that's where you went. That's where all the top bodybuilders, you know, trained at. So John Kemper took, he was the owner of the gym at the time passed away, you know, uh, shit, probably nine years ago, eight, nine years ago. Um, but he was like a mentor to me. You know, he took me under his wing. I, I ran his business for 11 years, worked for him, ran the gym. But he said, you know, you uh, you definitely have potential. And, and uh, he said, you have incredible work ethic. And so if this is something you want to do, you can do it. And, and, you know, what he said, what stands out most is you have great structure good symmetry, great structure. And he saw me on stage and he goes, you have this light about you on stage. It just comes across well to the judges. You know, mm -hmm. good smile. You make it look natural. You make it look effortless. And he's like, and I think you can go a long way. So, you know, coming from somebody like him, who was an N NPC chairman of, the, of at the time and an IFBB pro judge, you know, I, I kind of took him seriously. Yeah, right. Of course, that's a big compliment coming from him. Yeah. So you turned pro. You win the overall nationals. And what is your first pro show after that? Well, it wasn't that easy. You know, it, it was a little bit of a struggle, you know. So I made my way up to the junior USA. I took third there. Um, the next year, I went to the junior nationals, took second there. Mm -hmm. And it was such a good junior national show. Willie Stallings beat me in the light heavyweight class. Um, and uh, Dave Palumbo won the heavyweight class. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. So it was a good, there were some good bodybuilders at the time, you know. But uh, Willie and I were neck and neck, and and uh, I decided, hey, you know, I haven't taken much gear at that time. There were certain substances I haven't even put into my body. 
like, let me give it a shot at the Nationals this year. This was in 1995. You know, let me uh, let me see what I could do with this. You know, right. so from I believe the Junior Nationals at that time was in maybe June, May or June, and uh, I had until um, September to prepare for the Nationals. So you know, I, I got my ass in gear. And, you know, started prepping for the Nationals. Put on probably four pounds of muscle going into that show. Really? Yeah, I took fourth in the Nationals in the light heavyweight class my first year in 95. Wow. Then I did the Nationals again in 96. I dropped down to, I believe, sixth or seventh place. You know, uh, me and Dexter were sixth and seventh. Really? That. Yeah, it was a weird show, dude. It was like we kind of got lost a little bit in the mix and, you know, maybe uh, overlooked because we should have been in the top five. Um, but that drove me, you know, dropping from making fourth my first year to drop into sixth or seventh, you know, my second year. So that was uh, 96, 97. I come back, I do the Mr. USA, win the light heavyweight class, do the nationals in Texas in 97, take third in the light heavyweight class. And then 98, I go back to the USA. And that's when they introduced the super heavyweight class. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of struggling to make light heavyweight at the time. So I'm like, yeah, let me fucking go heavyweight. Right. I'm going to go to the USA as a heavyweight. I weighed like two or three, dude. I was barely a heavyweight, you know? Mm -hmm. But I won the USA at the head at the, the heavyweight class at the USA <clears throat> and uh, prepared for the nationals that year and won the heavyweight class again in the overall and uh, got my got my pro card there at the nationals. All right. So for, for people that don't know and for the young guys that are watching this or, or, or listening to it, back then there was only bodybuilding. There was no classic. There was no physique. There was nothing like that. You can only get... You can only uh, compete in bodybuilding. So that meant that your class was stacked. Oh, dude, we, you know, my year when I won the nationals, I'm not sure what the tally is nowadays for the nationals, but at the time it was the biggest um, lineup in the history of the nationals. There was 180 competitive men bodybuilders at that right. show. I don't know if the bodybuilding shows are bringing in nowadays, but at the time that was, you know, it was all just bodybuilding. For girls, that was like the first year they had uh, fitness or figure. It was mm -hmm. fitness, and they had women's bodybuilding there also. Do you remember how many? Do you remember how many guys were in your class? <clears throat> in the heavyweight class, um, thirty something, yeah. thirty two, thirty four. Yeah. So, so coming in top five, top six, you know, top ten is significant. Well, dude, back then, you got to realize, you know, they gave away five pro cards at the Nationals until 98 when they introduced the super heavyweight class, and then they added a welterweight class, but I think that was a couple years later. Mm -hmm. So there was only six pro cards given at the Nationals, one at the USA, and one at the North American. So you're talking only eight pro cards given a year. Right. So every top bodybuilder was at these shows. Like, right, you know, right. the top five in that era – they were just waiting their turn to turn pro because it was just a matter of time that they were going to get it. Because they were, if you were good enough to crack in the top five, chances are you were going to be a good pro going into the scene. You just might need another year to develop or another year to dial it in properly. Right. Or, you know, you need this. Sometimes you need to wait your turn. You know, there's the politics of it. You know, like sure. who's favored, who's not, you know, who has an edge, you know, from, from the judge's standpoint or, you know, who, who looks better for the business model that year. You know, all those mm -hmm. things factor in. So you turn you you finally turn pro in ninety eight, right? Now you know bodybuilding, especially on the pro level or, or even the amateur level, is very expensive to compete in. Did you get an a sponsor right away? So you know that's what's funny is you you think you get your pro card and then everybody just comes out of the woodwork and they just want to sign you. It's nothing like that at all. <laughs> you know you uh, you you have to. Um, you got to go after it and market yourself and get it out there. And, and I was talking to a couple of different companies and uh, I ended up signing with MHP. I was mm -hmm. MHP's first um, athlete when they started the company, but I had, I had some sponsorship as an amateur. I was fortunate enough. I was one of the only amateurs at the time that had sponsorship. I was with um, Cytodyne. I was with, no, actually. Uh, I remember Cytodyne. Cybergenics. Cybergenics. Oh, really? It turned into Cytodyne. Then I was with uh, Universal. For, okay. for a big chunk of my amateur career. And then I believe it was champion um, up until right before I turned pro. And then it was MHP 
uh, right, for a good, good year or two after I turned pro. If you don't mind me asking, back then, what kind of money were these supplement companies paying you? So, because I was a new, as an amateur, I was, I got a, I believe a base amount, you know, uh, not much, dude. You know, maybe yeah, fifteen hundred dollars so. a month. Right, to right, be right. honest, I just wanted the free products. You know, there was products that I liked that I used. Right, and right, right, right. Spending money, you know, on certain products that I agreed with or, or utilized at the time. Um, so I was, I was happy to have that. You know, and sometimes you know, you just want to wear a shirt. And you want to go into a gym or go to a show with representing. It just you know, it raises your self-esteem. Hey, you know what? A company sees something in me. They believe in me. Right. Um, you know, and and you wear like a badge of honor that, hey, I'm with uh, I'm with Universal. I'm with what I'm with. I prevail right now. You know. Um, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. But uh, but you know, it, it's something to be proud of at that time because there there wasn't a lot of opportunity for all these athletes like there are now because you didn't have the type of exposure that it gets now. Mm, okay okay so you're with mhp and what was the first show that you did the first show i did was the toronto pro in 1999 so i turned pro the end of end of uh, 98 i think the the nationals that year was in november um in atlanta so i waited until uh may to do the toronto pro and the night of the champions and how did you do with those two shows so the toronto pro i took fourth in my first pro show um, I think there was about 45 guys in the lineup. It was fucking stacked. And then I went to the night of the champions. Uh, I think it was two weeks later and I was top 10. You were top 10. All right. Yeah. Did you make significant progress in those few months from going from the nationals to the so I, made, I made some, yeah. I mean, I, I made a big, I made a good jump my first year, you know, preparing to be as a pro. But then I was one of those guys where all right, I got my pro card, you know, not that I was fucking around before. You know, right. You're fighting to get that pro card now. Yeah, now you want to make an impact. Yeah, right. right you know, right. so you got something to prove. You're the hot new pro, getting in the magazines, getting getting the publicity, getting some notoriety. You want to make sure that. Uh, and I was one of those guys where you know you either show up in shape or you you don't come at all. You know, right, so right, right, right. there's a sense of pride that goes along with uh, preparing for a competition. Um, you know, for me anyway. Uh, yeah. So, so I wanted to make a good showing. I wanted to show that I deserve to be there because, you know, I'm a smaller guy getting his pro card. Um, you know, when you're up against all these, you know, monsters, you yeah. know, there's, there's some criticism, you know, yeah. well, what's it going to do? Is it a waste of a pro card? Is it this, is it that, you know, and then you just want to show everybody up. Yeah. And there was no 202 or 212, you know, so you turned pro and you had to stand next to fucking Paul Dillette on stage and you're yeah. like holy shit yeah. you know it's literally going from college to uh to pro football like man right. Right. this ain't uh this ain't we're not in kansas anymore yeah, and back then you got to remember it's not even like nowadays where these guys are competing seldomly you know like dude these shows were stacked yeah you, know, you had paul delay you had chris camara you had lee priest you had flex really you had sean you had these guys were in every show mm -hmm. Darium, charles milos like all these top guys were in every single show because they, people were trying to win prize money. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right, that's why, yeah. like, I hear now, oh, no, for my health, for the fucking health, dude. What are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If you're yeah, in this sport, if you're in this sport for your health, you'd be in a, you should pick a better fucking sport, dude. Yeah, you know? no, one hundred percent. It's different it's now. Healthy, yeah, not that it's not a healthy lifestyle, right? Right. But the last four or five weeks, that's when you got to be careful, right? Yeah, right. Um, but dude, back then, you know, we know we have a we have a, a time, you know, a shelf a shelf life, and uh, you make a good showing, you do your best, and then you get out, you know. So did you ever win an open show before they came out with two hundred two, and and then they finally came out with two hundred two, and how many shows did you do in two hundred two? So the first show I did in the two hundred twos was, I believe, the New York Pro. Mm -hmm. um, took third there and qualified for the Olympia. And took fourth in my first Olympia. Wow, really? Okay. And did you ever win uh, a two hundred two? No, I took third, and I took third a couple times, and then from cracking the top five in the Olympia, you you requalified for the the year before. Did that bother you? Did that, that you never won a pro show? Um, I mean, of course, I'd like that. 
No, it's it's not something that eats away at me, you know. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, I would have loved to. Yeah. You know? Right. But the you know, the goal was to get to the Olympia. You know, mm-hmm. the goal was to, you know I would have really liked to crack the top three at the Olympia. Right. There was guys that I knew that you know I just wasn't going to beat. You know, there's guys that are right, they got to be off because at the time, dude, it was it was a stack lineup. You know when. You got me, you got Flex Lewis, you got Jose Raymond, you got Eduardo, you got Mark Dugdale, you got David Henry when David Henry was David Henry. Yeah. You got Kevin English. You know, dude, uh, Kevin a, English, yeah. These guys were fucking good, dude. Yeah, know? Kevin so, English was the dominant 202 guy for a while. Yeah, and, and Flex was, you know, at the time, like, you know, if they would have if they would have had the 202 class three or four years earlier, then I I I, I would have had at least one Olympia. Right, 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 right. Because right, those right. were my peak prime years. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm getting into the Olympia already at 36 years old. Ah, right. You right, know, right, so right. my first Olympia, I was already 36. You know, mm-hmm. so and dude, not that I didn't look good, and I think my last Olympia in 2011 was probably my best showing out of all the other Olympias. But dude, I, I still was only I probably should have had fourth. Um, mm-hmm. but still, you know, those top four guys, dude, were, were fucking phenomenal. Yeah, no joke. Like Absolutely. I said, there was guys like that were going into the prime, like a Flex Lewis. And did they? I knew at that time, I was not going to beat Flex Lewis. Yeah, you know, right. there was a couple other guys that they got to be really off, you know, for me to win. So I was, I was content, you know. Um, dude, being top four in the world is, isn't, uh, you know, it's not a bad thing. You know? No, it ain't bad at all. No, no, not at all. Um, what was the deciding factor? When did you say, okay, uh, I'm done. I'm walking away. I'm retiring. So I wanted to retire at 40. Um, that was it. You know, um, however, my last Olympia at 39, um, at 39, going into 40, my second daughter was born. Mm. So, you know, competing for these shows, especially now, I got a full-time job. I was working for, for a different company. Um, we had just started another supplement company that was, I was with a bunch of other guys that we left the company and started another one. Um, we had just bought a new house. We had our second daughter on the way. Um, my wife was, you know, persistent on me taking the year off. Um, and at that time, dude, I'm 40. You know, I was like, you know, now I got to start worrying about health. Yeah, right. And they had right. just mentioned that in 2012, they're going to make the two or two pound class 212. So that bothered me. Um because I really didn't see the significant factor in why they were doing that. I wasn't sure I was... why they would. I thought they should have kept it 202. Um, so another decision was I now being 202 where I got to, I can't gain weight that much in the off season anymore. So I don't have to take as much. Mm-hmm. I don't have to use as much, you know, uh, enhancements in the off season. Um, you know, I could, I could focus on my health at that time because I am reaching 40. Um, so when they introduced the two to 12 pound division, I was like, you know, now I got to take more shit, right. do this longer to add 10 pounds of muscle for what? It's going to be the same guys and we're all going to fall in the same place. We're just going to be 10 pounds heavier. Right, 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 right. So it really didn't make much difference. And the prize money wasn't that great at that time. So uh, I decided to clean myself out. I was draining my blood probably every two to three weeks because my hemoglobin levels were through the roof. My hemocrit levels were through the roof. And now I'm worried. I got two daughters. I got to worry about health. And, uh, you know, that was it. But then um, 2013 with the new company, they were kind of leaning on me. Hey, dude, you know, you're supposed to be our athlete. We need you to compete. Like, dude, you're going to fucking pay for it? Like, you know, like, you know. Yeah, right, right, right. So they go draft up, draft up a deal and and uh, say, well, dude, if you want me to do this, I got to do it now. And I'm only doing one show. I'll do this to help the company. They thought it was good for the company. Um, and dude, I was clean. You know, I was already down to like, you know, 210 pounds when I'm usually mm. 230 in the off season. Right, right, right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, they were dragging their feet. They didn't want to pay me. So literally about... 14, 15 weeks before the first show of the season. Um, oh, can you do it? We'll give you this, this, and this. Like, yeah, I mean, they weren't giving me much. Right. And it really wasn't an incentive enough for me to do it. But uh, I did it for that. I took one on the chin, and I, I did it for the company. But, dude, it was, I made a horrible showing. I did not like – I when I started my prep, I was lighter 
than I usually was when I'm when mm. I'm four weeks out from a show. So I had to rebuild. So I didn't have that extra time to gain 10 pounds of muscle. Right. I had to kind of work to get back where I was. So I did one show and I looked horrible and I decided to call it, you know, call it, call it a night. Gold that was quiz. It. Okay. What show did you actually do on the last? That was the, the New York Pro. Okay. Okay. I got so. to retire at home. You know, I got to retire, you know, with the, the home crowd and right. you know, New York city. So it was, it was nice. All right. That's good. A lot of guys have a problem when they go from, well, especially any athlete, but with bodybuilding, they usually have an issue when they go from being an athlete, a bodybuilder to going to be a regular dude, if, if that makes sense. They have like an identity crisis. You know, their entire identity revolves around that I'm a bodybuilder, I'm larger than life, I, I'm a competitive athlete, and it's a difficult transition for a lot. Was it difficult for you? Um, yes and no. You know, for, for the difficult part was training. Because now I'm going to the gym with no purpose. Right, okay. Not, not that I didn't have a purpose, right? But I'm not training for anything. Mm -hmm. Which that, that hunger, you know, that drive is just gone. Mm -hmm. um, as far as identity, you know, um, I could recreate myself, you know, and, and I... I have other talents and, and I'm good at other things. The, the sad thing is when somebody thinks that all they are is a bodybuilder. You know, um, at the time I was making money, you know, during my bodybuilding stages, uh, I was investing in housing. I was doing mortgages. I was involved with real estate. You know, I, I had other, other facets to earn money. I knew bodybuilding wasn't going to pay the bills. So I had to do other things to earn a living. Um, you know, and I had a I had a knack for formulating products and, and being involved and and uh, you know my my first year at the Olympia I was approached uh, with a company and they said hey you know well, actually I, I talked to them I said I'd love to be one of your athletes they pulled me and they had me work one of their events and they said hey they called me down to their offices we want to meet with you and the owner I said okay so I'm thinking all right they're going to sign me as an athlete and he goes look we uh, we want you to work for us I said oh great. And uh, he goes, but not as an athlete. Really? Yeah. So what do you mean? I said, dude, we've never heard anybody talk about products the way you do at our booth. You know, he's like, we want to offer you a sales position. So I said, he said, we'll still sponsor you as an athlete, but we want you in the sales department. I said, really? And do we offer you benefits? We'll offer you this, we'll offer you that. You know, we'll give you a salary. So I, got a, I have a newborn daughter at the time. You know, medical benefits. Hey, it makes sense. But I was a top salesman for three years, you know? <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, I ran the Northeast. I ran 11 states. And and uh, then I left that company, started a different one. And I was a top salesman there for all seven years that I was there. And then I left there and started my own. So, okay. you know, there was other things and, and competing with the other sales reps at the time, like, uh, they're not going to beat my numbers, you know, and they're not going right. to do this. And, and, you know, landing into new accounts and help developing products, you know, that's more of the competitive side of me, you know, so oh, I, I, can, gotcha. I can take, for me, it wasn't just bodybuilding. It was just competing because mm -hmm. I was an athlete. I just want to compete. Don't let, put me fucking anywhere, dude. I just want to compete. Right, 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 right. Give me one of those escape rooms. I'm going to fucking get out of that room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will find a way, you know? Um, so, yeah. So what, what made you decide to start I Prevail Subs? So, you know, most of my amateur and, and, and pro career, you know, when you get to that level, you know, your physique is going to take you so much. Your, your training is going to take you so far. Your nutrition is going to take you so far and the drugs are going to take you so far. What else you got, right? Mm -hmm. What else do you have that could give you an edge? So I got into proper nutrition, dieting better, preparing for contests that way. That's why I always did my own contest preps, but sports supplements, you know, and look, even if it adds six, seven percent, if it only is six, seven percent to make you better, I'll fucking take it. Right, right, right. I don't want anybody else having that six, seven percent. Mm -hmm. So I learned what you should use. I learned what works for the body. I learned how your body metabolizes things. I learned what works well with others. I worked what stimulants are good, what stimulants are bad. I worked, I realized and learned what nitrous oxide ingredients for blood flow that are going to help you. What, what products are better for recovery, what to do during your workout, what to do after your workout, what to do before bed, all different forms of supplementation. And this is on top of eating a perfect diet. 
Mm -hmm. They say, oh, if you eat a good diet, you don't need supplements. Well, granted, you get your nutritional value. But if you want to be a superior athlete and you're not recovering properly and you can't pay strict attention to your diet, well, then supplements are a big factor. Mm -hmm. You know, so I wanted to learn the ins and outs of this and formulations and so forth. And, you know, I did that for a couple of the companies that, that I worked for. I started giving advice on how to formulate. And, and then I realized, what the fuck am I doing it for them for? You know, right. I had money. You know, I'll start small. I'll grow the business this way. I don't need an investor. I do it all on my own. My, all on my own. It's my wife and I. And, uh, you know, we took the risk. And, uh, you know, I wanted to do this years ago, you know. Right. But then, you know, I got a daughter, I got this, you got that, I got benefits. But now, you know, we were we were set. We had some money put away. And, uh, you know, I, I promote the show also. So we always have that money to fall back on. Um, my wife works. So I was like, you know what? Now's the fucking time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's develop products <laughs> that I fully want to make. Not today. They like these ingredients, but they want to go this way because that's more mainstream. You know, I, I want to make them. For guys that want to recover and you don't have to be a pro bodybuilder to use my products you don't i use a, it yeah you don't have to be a pro athlete to use it but if yeah. you want to re recover better if you want to use a product that's better than the rest well then that's that's what i that's what i do right so you have i prevail subs which you go to i dash prevail subs.com great stuff use my uh discount code sns10 and you also have muscle beach every year yes sir and when did you start that so my first year, that was 2009. Actually, no, 97, 98, 99. I had it as an amateur. And then my first year turning pro. And then I went through my divorce with my first wife, and it was messy, so I gave it up for a while. And, and uh, then I got back into the scene in, uh, in 1999. I got the show back, and I've been running it ever since. Yeah, I was off for two years because of COVID, um, but, but last yeah. year was the first year back, and now I'm already getting everything together for, for this season. Okay, great, great. I know I was there. I had a booth there, and I had a blast actually. And uh, I'll be there again this show. Yeah. Also, now we have uh, our own show on muscular development. We do. It's one that... of the top hottest shows around, making uh, making its making its rounds through the uh, through the internet. It's always in the top three on muscular development as far as the shows. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, last last week. The the Hunter Labrada was definitely the best the best one we had, yeah. and then uh, Nick Trigilli covered us, right? Yeah, <laughs> and then we had John John De La Rosa, but uh, we got a good cast. It's me, you, Fackery, Danny Broadhurst, uh, Nate Spear, Carlos Thomas Jr., and now we have Flex Bo Lewis, all star lineup. Yeah, all star lineup, great guy. Well, that's a good thing too, is we all add like a different element, you know. And yeah. everybody has their own view on things. Everybody has their own angle on how they see things, um, and it adds uh, some interesting dialogue and some uh, some pretty good conversations. Oh yeah, absolutely, and it and it's fun, and you know we we have fun. Yeah, being a guys night out without being a guys night out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Without the hookers and the booze. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh shit! All right, so that's so we're gonna call it quits, but we will be back. We could always catch me and Arns on Muscle Development. The show is called MD Muscle Talk. We have it once a week. It usually comes out on a Friday. We record it on a Wednesday, and I have a catchphrase. My catchphrase is: I am not gonna stop doing my podcast until we have a booth at the Olympia with large-breasted women and Hell's Angels as security. <laughs> And look, if anybody has questions or they want they want something answered, or they want to make a statement, yeah, email you or DM you, and you know we will answer these questions on our on our podcast. We will bring absolutely to any interests that uh, that come our way. Yeah, you too. Actually, they could always DM you and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, that would actually help because every year, every week, we got to figure out a topic. Yeah, I'm on Instagram, I underscore prevail Sups or Jason Arntz. Uh You could you could find me there. And John has his Instagram, his YouTube, and his uh, what else you got? You got an email, oh, cell yeah. phone. Yeah, sell my cell phone. <laughs> yeah, it would be even if I even if I put my fucking cell phone, nobody would call it. Yeah, that's it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, his, throw, his throwaway phone, his flip phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. My burner phone. His burner but, phone. I couldn't find the word. Yeah, but 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 everybody has to uh, please like and subscribe to Serious and Cylinders Bodybuilding because. I don't know if anybody really saw it. I'm putting out some really good content 
I'm, I'm putting out a level content. Hey, you're doing your work. Yeah. I, and it's not even, I'm not even bullshitting. I will put my channel up against desktop RX muscle. Nick trajilli has got a, his own weird thing going on. Uh, 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 yeah. I'll, I will put it up against desktop RX muscle. Uh, who else? I wouldn't. Uh, Nick strength and power just buries me. I can't. I can't deal with him. <laughs> but as far as the content, you know, we got some heavy hitters. We had uh, Jake yeah. Cutler on here. We had uh, Linda Murray. We've had Jose Raymond. We've Kamali? had. We had King, King Kamali. King. We had the King. The Kamali is fucking great. Dude, he's a dude. he's well, so. He's fucking. got. He's got a special place. In my heart, because we went through the ranks together, and uh, yeah. you know, we we had him and I had a really good camaraderie as competitors, uh, became friends, and uh, you know, I edged him out my my year at the nationals, and then came back the next year to, to cheer him on, and yeah. you know, he he swept through the heavyweight class, and uh, and dude, he made a good showing as a pro. He had a oh good, yeah, yeah, he, he did good run as a pro. Yeah. Um, but dude, he, he guest posed for me when I ran the show in, in 97, 98 or 99. Really? So, yeah, we in contact and we hooked up every now and again. Um, and to that, that that's the shit I miss about the sport. Is, yeah. uh, you know, some of the guys you compete with and and uh, you, you go through the battles with, um, you just earn a sense of respect for each other, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Jay, thank you very much for coming on. I will see you tomorrow night. And uh, remember, I prevail subs.com and, and like, and subscribe to this channel, please do me a fucking favor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Later.